again, when we talk about influences, right, your circle of influence has the greatest impact on you. There's a study done on kids who smoke, <clears throat> kids who, who end up smoking, and they're looking at what are the greatest influences for a kid to smoke. If one parent smokes, there's a small percent. If two parents smoke, there's a bigger percent. But they look at then the circle of friends. Well, if one friend smokes, it goes up significantly. If two friends smoke, it's like an 85% chance that the kid will smoke. So your friends have all the influence, really. So when you sit at a table, like dental society meeting or something like that, and you have your peers around you, and you're comparing notes, and you're looking at what what they're all doing, like you're the sum of your five closest influences. This is actually like very clearly proven. If you look at what your friends are doing, you know exactly what you're going to do. If you're trying to lose weight and you hang around with fat people, it's not going to happen, right? And that's just the end of, that's just how it is. Like you have to be around people who are where you want to go or better. And so for that reason, I haven't been to a Down Society meeting in Sault Ste. Marie for five years. I actually quit this year altogether. So I wouldn't even be tempted to go. And it's not that I don't like, I still have friends, we still have like, people that I talk to, but I talk to them differently. We're at, we, it's a different conversation. I'll go to the CE events and that sort of thing, but I'm out of that game intentionally. <clears throat> I don't want to be around negative influences. And, you know, whatever it is about, I guess, most crowds, I just want to be the guy in the room who doesn't belong because everyone else is more successful than me. If I'm in that place, then I'm always being pulled up. So that's something to think about. Basically, you are what you think about all day, okay? So you know all the thoughts or things. I mean, this is true. It's proven. This, this is human psychology. So there's a thing in Western culture that's like, who am I? You know, find yourself. Who am I? And I think that that's like, that's a mistake. The question should be, who am I becoming? Because it's an active process, and it's something that we need to be working on. It's not a static thing or it's like, I, I'm, this is who I am. I'm a dentist. I'm a father. I'm great. Okay. So, so these are the things that I am. Because we ask most people, who are you? It's like, here's what I do. Here's, you know, my hobbies and whatever. And they just give you this like cookie cutter thing. And I don't agree with that because <clears throat> if you identify as who I am and that's who you are and that's who you stay, I look at it from this perspective. I've been doing this for a number of years and it's incredibly helpful, I think. And again, when you look at psychology, there's clear reasons why this is the case. So when I grew up, I was the shyest kid you've ever met, literally, like crazy shy. I cried the entire first day of kindergarten because I was like that shy, okay? There, this, this story still exists back home. You'll hear it once in a while, okay? person who you know, knew me way back in elementary school, like that was a kid that it actually made it to the, the grade 8 graduation of that class. This was the thing that, this is something that was mentioned at their speech. I still remember when, right, literally cried the entire first day. And I remember, because my niece is doing, uh, this is the season for oral presentations, right? So they're doing orals in school. And so she, I was listening to what she was doing, and I thought, it's great, this, this would be fun. And I remember when I was doing that, and it made me physically ill to do that, <coughs> to get up in front of a group of people and talk about anything, didn't matter. So you think about that. By the way, uh, this is an interesting one. If you want to read, this is a Gallup study. So top fears of Americans. This is just a US study, that's why it says so. So the number one is snakes. Number, number two is public speaking, okay? So for your kids who have orals right now, then just know that that's a thing, right? <clears throat> the reason I'm telling you that is I started there and that stuck with me for a while, like grade school and so on. But one thing that you do that I encourage you to do as a habit is to look around you. Who are the people that you look up to? Like who are the people that are killing it in their area? And what aspects about them do you want to pull into your life? So again, it's like build this vision of who am I becoming? Who do I want to be more like? Instead of like, well, you know, I watch this person on TV or whatever. So like I look at, okay, who's a, you know, I see this person in movies. I see this person and then they have a reality show. And instead of like watching the movies and watching the reality show, like look at this person's life. I want to just be that. Like what can I take out of that and pull into my life? Because it's obviously been really successful for that person. So I look at things like, you know, who's got finances nailed? Okay, well, I study Warren Buffett. 
wouldn't it be bad to pull some things out of that person's perspective? What about, I don't know, persistence? How about Michael Jordan? Study Michael Jordan. There's about nine documentaries you can watch. There's like 100 books. But when you start to study some of those things, it's like, okay, I get what actually made this person become what they are. And you start creating this sort of vision of, I want to have financial ability like Warren Buffett. I want to have persistence like Michael Jordan. I want to have like pain tolerance like Muhammad Ali who get punched in the face and whisper in the person's ear, is that all you got? You know what I mean? If you have, if you can create this vision of who you want to become, then you're always growing. And by the way, for you guys who are journaling on a regular basis, right? Because we've talked about that many times, morning and night, you just look at that. Like you have just jotted down, like who am I becoming? I'm becoming this. Right? Again, affirmations, because these things actually become true. You train your subconscious mind, and what happens over time is that's exactly what happens. That's exactly what you get. So <clears throat> you'll see how this all wraps into this topic as we get into it. <clears throat> so don't ever let anyone tell you what you can and can't be. Okay, We're all whoever we think we are at that given time. Right. So Shakespeare's thing was like, all the world is a stage. And we're about actors, right? Why? Because you can be whoever you want to be, and that's just what we are. We are whoever we think we are right now, and that's what we're portraying out to the world. So you can change that, okay? And I promise this isn't going to be all just you know metaphysical stuff, but this is really important as a foundation because if you don't get this, the rest of it doesn't work because your psychology will screw this up faster than anything else, right? <clears throat> that's basically the bottom line. So... <clears throat> Again, the real question is, who are you becoming? If you look at, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of, of work in the human psychology area that you can study on this, but one good one is Maxwell Maltz. If you want to look up his work, I'll save you some digging. The quick story is, um, story of an eight-year-old boy, okay? Eight-year-old boy was like any other boy, but in grade school, failed a grade. Wasn't very good at math wasn't very good at a lot of subjects. And parents told the kid they weren't going to amount to much, and the teachers weren't really much more helpful. And so the kid, what does the kid think? Well, I'm stupid, and I'm not going to amount to much. So along comes this fellow, Maxwell Maltz, who has a study and pulls in a lot of kids like this boy. And after a couple of years, his grades are fantastic. He graduates at the top of his class. And doesn't have any of those previous issues. So what was the difference? He didn't work on the boy's math skills, didn't tutor him at all. All that, that took place was he worked on the boy's psychology, self-concept. He got the boy to believe there was no difference between him and the other boys. There was no difference between what he could achieve and what they could achieve. And as long as that changed, everything else changed. Without tutoring, mentoring, anything to do with schoolwork, the kid's grades magically shot up and completely changed his life. So working on self-concept is not a small thing. It's everything. When I was a struggling, if you can call this struggling, I mean, you know, as you said earlier, white collar problem, like two and a half million dollar practice, running ragged, the thing that had to shift in my mind was that I could have a five million dollar practice why I wasn't running ragged. And then from there, the shift was that, hey, I could grow it again and add another 50% without running ragged. In fact, I could work less. It's possible. And if you can believe it, you can do it. That's the bottom line. So now let's get into the actual program and we'll get into some tactics on how we do this stuff, okay?